uh, among genetics. Uh, and uh, in tigers, we, we are supposed to have nine subspecies with four of them already being extinct, the Javan, Balinese, South China, and the Caspian tiger, while the Amur tiger, which is found in, in Russia and in parts of China, the Bengal tiger, of course, in India, um, and parts of other parts of Asia, the Indo-Chinese, Malayan, and the Sumatran tiger are the other five extant uh, tiger species. It used to be found in 30 countries or 30 present day countries across the globe, but currently we have them only uh, surviving in 11 countries and within 7% uh, of their historic range, as I said earlier. And uh, globally, we are supposed to have about 4,000 tigers and uh, India forms about 75% of the global wild tiger population. All of you may know that there are more tigers in captivity in the US and mostly in, the, in California than they are in the wild. So the global wild tiger population is only 4,000 and India accounts to about 75% of that population, which is about 3,000 individuals. And in India, um, uh, the tiger population was not doing very well in the 60s and the 70s. So early 70s, in 1973, the government India, government of India with support from non-governmental organizations started something called as Project Tiger. And then they started with nine tiger reserves across the country where the focus was supposed to be uh, protection of tigers uh, and the ecosystem and their entire landscape. And uh, since 1973 uh, till now, uh, the number of tiger reserves has drastically increased. It started with nine tiger reserves and we have 51 tiger reserves in the country now. Uh, and tigers are found in 12 of the 28 states across the country. And if you see um, the tiger reserves form about 2.23% of the country's geographical area, which is about 73,000 square kilometers, which is just less than UAE. So these are all the different tiger reserves spread across the country. But of course, tigers are found beyond tiger reserves. And if, you, I, if I put all the areas of tiger reserves together and into the map of UAE, as you see it on the right, it will almost encompass the entire um, United Arab Emirates, which is about 83,600 square kilometers. So the number of tiger reserves, the geographical area of tiger reserves in India is almost equivalent to uh, the entire country of UAE or the Federation of um, uh, States of United Arab Emirates. And um, tigers are a habitat generalist. You know, they survive in all kinds of habitats. In Russian Far East, they survive in sub-zero temperatures of minus 40. Uh, if you come to India, they survive in te temperatures of plus 40 degrees centigrade. And in terms of habitats, you can find them in grasslands like this or in climax forests called as sholas in the Western Ghats, in Southern Western Ghats, where this chain of mountains runs for about 1,700 kilometers along the Western coasts of our country. They're found in woodland savanna habitats. This is a very beautiful habitat, very typical to the savannas you see in Africa, but on undulating terrain here, while in African savannas, it's much more plain and flat. You also find them in riverine habitats like this or in very dry habitats. This is one of the habitats I work in, in, in Karnataka, in southern India, in the state of Karnataka. And this is a protected area called Ka Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary. And the river Kaveri is what is flowing through this dry habitat where the temperatures goes up to 40 degree in the summer. Except for the riverine habitat, everything goes completely dry, but a fantastic habitat. Um, they're also found in these riverine habitats in, in Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary, but, and they're found in evergreen habitats in many parts of the country, including Northeast, um, almost uh, uh, at the elevation of 3,000, 3,500 uh, meters in the Himalayas. And interestingly, they're also found in the intertidal mudflats of the Sundarbans, which is in north uh, northeast India, bordering Sundarbans in uh, bordering Bangladesh, uh, this um, mangrove forest are spread between India and uh, the country of Bangladesh. And even the, in this place, you'll see beautiful uh, tigers. So as you've seen uh, in these few pictures, their habitat generalists surviving in a wide variety ha of habitats. And um, in, in India, we use tigers as an umbrella species. 
under the name of tigers, an entire ecosystem is protected and many other endangered species, including elephants or one-horned rhinoceros, or even birds like critically endangered king, you know, red-headed vulture, or the Bengal florican, which is found only in some parts of the country, again, critically endangered. They all get protected under the, under the guise of tiger protection. That's why we call tigers as an umbrella species. Uh, lots of smaller species um, and a lot of uh, flora, fauna, um, and then uh, uh, entire ecosystem these forests offer are all protected in the name of tigers. But a very key uh, question everybody would ask uh, anytime they go to a protected area or to a tiger reserve is how many tigers are there? How many tigers are found in Nagarhole or in Bandipur or in Kaziranga or in Rantambur, uh, which some of you may have visited at some point of time? That's a key question many scientists had or even today we face uh, when um, we are talking to political leaders, we are talking to media personnel, we are talking to common people. So, uh, but the problem with some of the wildlife species, they survive in habitats like this. This is one of the places where we intensively work called MM Hills Wildlife Sanctuary. It's a very rugged terrain, uh, but also very undulating. So when we are monitoring cryptic species like tigers, uh, we, have, we face two major challenges. One is observability. The second one is called a spatial sampling. Observability is because we are unable to see many of these individual animals because they are hiding under a, a rock crevice or they are in a valley and we can't be in all the place in the entire sampling area at the same time. So we have these two critical problems called as observability and spatial sampling. We can't see all the animals when we are sampling and we cannot be at all the places at the time of sampling. That, these are the two key challenges to monitor cryptic species like tigers. So what happened? How do you count them? How do you estimate them? So the first um, uh, methodology to estimate some of these species uh, was started in 1896 in the US when they were trying to actually estimate uh, fish abundance uh, for, for uh, harvesting fish, actually, for sport fishing. Um, and this is a methodology called as capture recapture. You capture an animal, tag it or mark it and release it back to the wild. And then you recapture some of the animals, uh, uh, some of those marked animals. Um, and then you try to come out with an estimate using very statistical, uh, rigorous statistical methodologies. And for tigers uh, or any other naturally marked animal, one thing which came very helpful was uh, these camera traps, uh, which are triggered by infrared or they are either motion sensor uh, triggered by motion or by uh, uh, temperature. But this methodology of capture recapture can be used on any species which has natural markings on its body. It can be giraffe. So if you see the markings, the blotches on giraffe's neck or on any part of the giraffe is different on different individuals. It can also be used on a variety of other species. It could be amphibians, reptiles. Um, it could be so many other species. This is a salamander called, uh, this is a newt called as a great crested newt from UK. And I was, when I was doing my master's, I used to go uh, at five o'clock in the, in the British uh, winter cold, uh, catching, trying to catch great crested newts in their ponds to estimate their numbers. So you, as you will see very easily, this great crested newt, and these are completely different individuals, um, which can be identified the markings on, under their body. So uh, similarly, uh, to estimate tiger numbers, uh, it's very simple. You set up, uh, you know, in, infrared rim, uh, camera traps uh, where in your area of sampling. And uh, as you see in the picture, the stripe patterns on the tigers are completely different. They're like the uh, imprint on our thumb or on our fingers. Every individual have a different thumb uh, thumb print. So you capture a lot of tiger pictures when you're camera trapping, and the uh, 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 the uh, the stripe on the left flank and the stripe on the right flank are also completely different as you will see in these pictures. So you need to ensure that you have pictures from both the sides of the animal. 
And then uh, if you go to sample an area, you'll not just get tigers, but you'll also get a host of other animals, right? From tigers to their prey, to people, to livestock. So you need to, uh, if you want to estimate tiger numbers, you get all these different you know, pictures of tigers. You initially identified them individually. Uh, uh, earlier, we used to identify them um, manually, but now we have software to individually identify these animals. So you get a whole variety of pictures of tigers, not just the good pictures of flanks, but you'll also get very curious animals coming close to your um, camera trap and you get their images. So you get a host of images and I'll give you a very simple uh, estimator called as the Harvard Thompson estimator. Uh, so not all animals in your sampling area will be captured in your camera traps. I'm sure you will understand that very easily. But uh, what you're trying to estimate is N hat, the now abundance or true number of animals in your sampling area. And uh, through your camera trapping or through your sampling methodology for other species, uh, you'll get a you'll get C, which is the number of animals which you have counted, or in our example, which you have uh, which have appeared in your camera trap. So if you estimate P the detection probability or the proportion of animals that have appeared in C, you will be able to calculate N. So this, how do you calculate P is the statistical methodology we all use. And uh, that takes a whole uh, effort to do calculate P and uh, you go through an entire process of um, uh, statistical methodologies. And um, not just, uh, and then you count the number of animals, but you also get to understand a host of other interesting facts when you're uh, camera trapping for uh, uh, tigers or for any other animal. Uh, for example, this particular individual male tiger has a home range of about 359 square kilometers or about 88,710 acres, which is 359 square kilometers is like 11 or 12 times the size of Dubai, actually. Dubai is, I read on the internet that Dubai's size is about 35 square kilometers. So this one individual tiger has a home range of 12 times the size of Dubai city. That's the kind of uh, information you can still get from this kind of scientific work. But you also get to see a host of other animals, uh, which you can estimate. For some of them, you can use camera trapping data to estimate, uh, for example, those. Um, you get also very nice uh, pictures of other animals. Uh, for example, this uh, elephant with its calf is rubbing on the tree uh, to scratch themselves, but you also see our camera trap there. And next morning we go to collect data. This is what we see. And the animals have not shown any sympathy on our camera traps. They've muddied our camera traps. Each camera costs a lot of money, but they don't care about it. But we get very nice information. Sometimes, Animals are also very curious about our equipment. So if this particular elephant, the tusker, carried away six of our cameras in one night. So if you see between his legs, he's carrying a, one of our camera traps. I don't know why he felt it interesting. He just walked away with camera traps. Uh, it could also be because he's in must. If you observe the temple of this elephant, uh, he's, um, uh, there's a liquid coming out of it and uh, he's most probably in must. And, he didn't like the flash or he didn't like the external object. Uh, it's not just the light sometimes, I, as I'll show you in my next picture. They're very sensitive to smell. So something external they always don't like. So this individual tusker carried away six camera traps in one night and we were able to recover only one of them. I don't know what he did with the other five. Perhaps he was taking selfies or he gifted some of them to his girlfriends. I don't know. I don't know what happened. But not all elephants or not all animals are very sympathetic to our camera trap or our scientific work, though we are doing our scientific work for conserving them. Uh, this particular tusker, um, you see what he does. Again, has an audio behind this, so please keep your uh, speakers on. Oops. Okay, those were 78 pictures stitched together because there's an opposite camera, as I said, where for counting animals, we put two cameras on left side and right side. So the, the, the Tusker didn't realize that there was another camera trap which was taking the 
all his naughty acts. But if you notice, you know, he was very unhappy about the camera trap. So he really smashed it, You even using his legs and walked away. He didn't even let the stump, the tree stump, we had, uh, you know, tied our camera trap on it before he uh, went away. He even pulled it down. But for some reason, our left side camera survived. And that is how we were able to understand who was the mischief, uh, who, uh, who did this mischief. Oh, sorry. And next day morning, you go to collect your camera trap data, and this is what you find. You know, each camera trap costs about $180, and he has no sympathy. They had no sympathy. Sometimes we can't even recover data. You know, even the SD card is smashed, and all we find is pieces of um, uh, plastic and pieces of um, uh, electronic circuit boards. That's what we find later. And sometimes we also get very nice and funny images of, um, of animals trying to show something. Uh, if there are ladies in the in the in the presentation today, please apologize. My please accept my apologies. And this is what some elephants does. I don't know why he did why she did it, but she did it and walked away. But it was you get all these kinds of interesting things. But we also get to document so many other cryptic species. For example, this honey badger. Um, until 2014, we never knew that uh, honey badgers were present in our part of the country, and we were the first people to document the presence of honey badger or rattle in this area. We also get to document what other critically endangered endangered species are there, like this pangolin, Indian pangolin, very beautiful animal carrying its young one on its back. One of the few pictures you can get to see them in the wild, where the young one is being carried uh, carried by the by a terrestrial animal. And uh, uh, one key aspect of this uh, this study is not just studying tiger. We can also study their prey animals, uh, though you get them on camera traps because they don't have natural markings on their body. Uh, we can't count them. You, we use distance, uh, distance sampling, which is another methodology to count um, uh, animals that do not have natural markings. But still camera trap data of these uh, animals which do not have natural markings has value. What we can look at is we can look at occupancy of these animals and uh, for example, a uh, higher uh, red color shows that there are more animals occupying a grid uh, using our camera trap data. So you can, uh, over a period of time, uh, for example, this is from 2014, 16, 18, and 20, you can see if the occupancy of a certain species has increased or shrunk, or if there is any other uh, patterns we can easily identify using for all species. So even if the numbers have not gone up of tigers, if the numbers have remained stable, if the animals have spread into newer areas where they were not found earlier, you can always estimate or you can always um, get a measure of conservation management and conservation success. So you can use camera trapping data in multiple ways as well. Of course, you know, tigers are endangered. And one of the main reasons was hunting um, uh, for their pelt and hunting it as a sport. Till 1972, hunting tigers in India was a, a legally allowed activity. You know, there were safaris and uh, organized uh, bringing people uh, for safari hunting like people does still in, in some parts of Africa and some parts of Asia. But in 1972, we got the first um, a law that prohibited uh, hunting of wildlife called as the Wildlife Protection Act. That's when the ban on hunting of wildlife species came into being, uh, into uh, picture. Till then, uh, you could go to people's house, you would find all these trophies. Our, um, you know, royalty also hunted, uh, the, the British also hunted. Uh, so it was a very common thing for hunting uh, wildlife in many parts of the country. And even today, of course, hunting, illegal hunting uh, goes on to meet uh, certain uh, demands from Southeast Asia for pelt, for tiger bone, and for so many other things. I'm sure all of you have heard of it. Um, but one serious aspect is not just hunting tigers. It's also the way uh, we, we are losing tigers also because we are losing their prey. So we don't have to directly exterminate tigers, but if we are exterminating tiger prey, we lose tigers because tigers need about uh, 3,000 to 4,000 kilogram of meat every year. So if you're just removing their tiger prey, uh, it's very easy to lose tigers as well. Many parts of the country in India and uh, Southeast Asia, many parts of uh, the country, uh, areas in um, uh, across the tiger range, 
tigers, though there is good habitat, intact habitat found, uh, we won't find tigers because there is not enough prey at all. And so one of the things we do is we just don't study animals. We also work with the government. We work with communities. We work with media personnel. We work with social leaders to ensure that we bring about changes for these species. Uh, this is a map of Karnataka in southern India, which is boxed in the red uh, rectangle here. So the, the dark green polygons used to be the protected area network in, in our state uh, before 2011 and 12. And the lighter green ones used to be the forest with lesser degree of protection. So one of the things we did was, or we continue to do is to work with the government to ensure these lighter green areas are also made as darker green so that there is more legal protection and extra funding from the government for conservation of tigers. So which literally means uh, increasing the status or uh, jacking up the status of these reserve forests to protected area. So if you see, if you notice, if I go back, uh, many of these areas which were light green have now become dark green, which means they have all become protected areas. They get additional funding, more protection, and they have a, a land tenure, which is more important. And then uh, uh, they have stricter regulation against diverting forest land for uh, non-forestry activities. So in, in some of the activities we have increased, we have added in the last 10 years, about a million acres of forest land as protected areas in Karnataka, which is one of the biggest um, addition to protected areas um, in the last uh, 30, 40 years, actually. So if you see one of our achievements have been to get a network of protected areas um, of the size of about 9,750 square kilometers in southern Karnataka. So you can walk into uh, a one protected area just south of Bangalore city, which is like the IT hub of the country and you can get out of another protected area uh, well here about 250 kilometers away. So we were able to stitch a network of protected areas just by working with the government. The other threat, serious threat to large mammals um, like tigers, which need wide range, uh, wide uh, large home ranges is uh, fragmentation. You know, for example, linear fragmentation like railway lines. This is one of the pictures we got in camera traps. One of my colleagues, a train passes a minute later, a tiger passes in the same location. Or, you know, India's economy is booming since the last uh, 20 years. Uh, the economy is rising, so infrastructure is developing. So many of these small roads which were passing through tiger habitats are now being widened, um, uh, made as a, a faster road. We have faster vehicles and all these animals, including tigers, face a uh, threat because of this from so many different angles. One is the impacts of fragmentation and the direct uh, impact of these developmental, uh, uh, for example, roads is uh, road kills of animals, including tigers. So another thing we are, but animals die because they don't follow uh, rules, traffic rules like all of us does, you know. Um, uh, zebra, they, do, they don't understand what zebra crossing is. So they just walk through the roads and then unfortunately they get killed. So one of the, and there's uh, many of these wildlife species also act as barriers, you know, for large uh, species like elephants, they're unable to cross from one part of the forest to the other part of the forest. So, it's very important that we design infrastructure projects in such a way that they are compatible with wildlife conservation as well. So um, as I said earlier, many of the infrastructure projects, which used to be small roads uh, in tiger habitats have been upgraded in the recent years. And this is one of the roads which uh, we worked with the government. And this was a road uh, which was passing through the Southern part of Nagarode National Park one of the best places for tigers anywhere in the world with a density of about 12 tigers per 100 square kilometers. A new road was being built, a large road with four lane road was being built. And we were able to convince the government to realign this road outside the tiger habitat. Though the road had been started, the government was convinced uh, by our activity and they built an alternative road by spending about $3.2 million. And this was the first time in the country that a road was realigned outside tiger habitats. Uh, this was way back uh, about uh, six, seven years ago. And uh, uh, about 10 kilometers was of road was removed from a tiger habitat and placed outside by spending $3.2 million. And the road, which was like this earlier, passing through tiger habitats is uh, very pleasantly, it, it looks like this today. 
So this is this is one of the satisfying pictures I've ever seen because this was the road where I had seen lots of vehicular traffic, a road like this, very fast track road. And today, this is how it looks like. The road is no more, uh, it's been realigned. So there's no traffic on this road. The, the tarmac road is gone. And this beautiful picture, you see a puddle of water on the road and a tiger drinking water out of this road. This is one of the uh, most satisfying pictures for me in my whole life um, that uh, you see this kind of changes. And that is why I call uh, wildlife conservation and tiger conservation is an art of the possible. If you work with the right stakeholder at the right time, it is certainly possible, even with the kind of population pressure, economic pressures India has. So a lot of times you see negativity, a lot of negativity in wildlife conservation. But I think if we did the right things at the right time, it is still possible to do save tigers uh, in this world. I'm very sure that there will be tigers in India, uh, even beyond my lifetime. And um, another story is, of course, there is infrastructure projects. There are other threats as well. This is one of the landscapes we work very closely, very intensively. This is BRT Tiger Reserve, which has about 55 tigers. The adjoining area is about 12 tigers and 77 in the neighboring state of Tamil Nadu, and only two tigers in Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary, which is just north of this area, but they're all interconnected. So animals, when they, the tiger numbers increases uh, and reaches ecological carrying capacity from areas like BRT, they'll start moving into newer areas, looking for uh, new spaces. That's why it's very important that we ensure that there is large, uh, spaces available for uh, species like tigers and elephants so that when the one, one area reaches ecological carrying capacity uh, they move into disperse into newer areas so as i said Kaveri, this is the place where we work very intensively uh, it's very dry habitat but becomes like this during monsoons um, and uh, uh, woodland savanna with the Kaveri river flowing through it and one of the pressures we see is uh, uh, anthropogenic pressures when we started working we saw that the uh, forest recovery was going down or the greenness of the forest was going down and one of the key reasons we saw was um, uh, low prey density livestock density was very high there was habitat degradation due to collection of firewood uh, uh, for cooking by people so on one uh, side, you have to work with the government to reduce the threats of infrastructure. But on the other side, you also need to work with other communities uh, to reduce their uh, impacts on wildlife on wildlife habitats. So one of the things we saw was that there were the degradation was happening due to heavy collection of firewood. Uh, we went and uh, surveyed over 5,000 people and we saw that 5,000 families and we saw 99% uh, of them were collecting firewood for domestic needs and uh, livelihoods. They were collecting about 23 species of trees, uh, tree species. Um, so it was very important to understand the tree species they were harvesting was also the same species uh, elephants and other tiger um, prey species were dependent on. For example, Albizia amara, which was collected by 62% of the beneficiary or the respondents, is a key uh, fodder species for elephants, especially for summer. So that's why wildlife conservation actually means you're conserving their habitat first, then everything comes up. So we designed a program. Uh, as I said earlier, if you're using excessive firewood, you, there'll be no regeneration of uh, plant species or slow regeneration because of oil exploitation. And these are the plant species which provide um, uh, uh, food and fodder for many herbivore species, including elephants and tiger prey, which in turn, uh, which in turn will impact tiger population. That's why we need to address these kinds of uh, uh, issues as well. So we designed, as I said earlier, Albizi Amara, if you see there's so much of feeding by elephants, there's elephant dung here and all the bark of this tree, you know, and here also you see, uh, it's all fed by elephants. So that's why it was important to protect this uh, tree species from prior root collection. So what we did was we went into the communities, spoke to them, uh, we convinced them to shift from firewood cooking to much more convenient ways of dealing with uh, cooking, which was LPG, liquefied petroleum gas. And we provided many of the uh, families couldn't afford the initial um, investment of about only about uh, $70 or $80 per connection, uh, including the stove and the uh, bottle required to uh, cook uh, yeah, to, to cook the LPG bottle. So we started working with them till uh, date we provided LPG connections, uh, but it's not as simple as 
just giving them uh, LPG connections. You also need to handhold them. You need to train them. You need to ensure that there is last mile connectivity to uh, reach refill bottles to these communities. That's a longer story. Um, but we just don't give out this uh, goodies to beneficiaries, but we also need to monitor. If you're a wildlife conservation organization and you're looking for changes, you also need to scientifically monitor your activities. For example, we monitor uh, how much firewood each uh, family consumes before we provided them with an alternative and one year after uh, we provide them with an alternative. And we have been able to monitor that and we have been able to come out with scientific results, quantitative results, how much you know people have reduced their firewood consumption by 65% after they shifted to uh, LPG. And the reason why we were not able to shift completely to, fire, uh, to LPG is because we have not been able to provide them alternatives for heating water. So in some of the beneficiary families we work, um, we have been able to reduce the firewood consumption from about 450 truckloads of firewood annually, which was used. And today it has been reduced to about 180 kilograms of 180 truckloads of firewood. I've just combined it to make it simple uh, 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 to make people understand how much would uh, the reduction of 65% would mean. This uh, each truck would be about five tons. So from 450 truckloads of firewood, it has reduced to about 180 truckloads of firewood usage. But what is there for communities? That's what they would ask. So we started monitoring um, uh, their lung functions because cooking using firewood also has a serious impact on their lung functions. Many people get into asthma, they get lung cancer, wheezing. So we designed a study to see what was the impact on people from shifting to from firewood to uh, LPG connect, uh, you know, liquefied petroleum gas uh, to LPG. So we our uh, study results very sh clearly showed that about sixty percent of the uh, of the people uh, who are actively using um, a firewood uh, for more than uh, ten years were actually impacted and they had lower lung functions after the and uh, especially if they were using firewood for over 10 years, and if they are non-smokers, about 55% of them had reduced lung functions. So this was a very important factor for them because many of them were women. So after we gave them uh, an alternative, and then we went back after one year and measured their lung function, we started to notice that their lung functions had started to stabilize, their, stabilize by that time. It would take about two to three years for their lung functions to improve um, uh, when they after they shift from firewood to um, uh, other alternative sources. But that's the kind of damage that would cause for their uh, lungs when they were using firewood. So it was an all, you know, it was a good solution for us. It was a solution both for people and for wildlife. But again, you know, as I said earlier, we had to take conservation commitments from them. Uh, one was that they would reduce firewood, but they would also not support poaching or they would not do poaching itself themselves. So these were the kind of conservation agreements we needed to have with the communities when we were doing these kind of community-based conservation activities. But we also engage with them through outreach activities. It could be street plays. Um, it could be in, in getting involved with religious leaders uh, so that we uh, take the message of conservation uh, to reduce the, um, uh, the key threat of poaching. We have also also set up a, a rural-based uh, conservation interpretation center where a lot of children come, a lot of school children, the uh, local media personnel, the police, we train police on these aspects uh, in these uh, um, rural-based interpretation centers. This is one of the first and only rural-based interpretation center in the country, while most of these centers are aimed at tourism tiger reserves, but we, we had a different approach to it. We wanted the communities who uh, live in and around these tiger reserves to come and understand the conservation aspects of the uh, wildlife we are working on. And we have started to see results. In one of the areas we have st started to see, you see there are two cubs in this picture. And one of the cubs, uh, this was a picture from 2014, this was the cub we first got in November 2014. And then again, 2016, she became a big, uh, big girl. She was a female, she was a tigress. She reappeared in our camera traps in 2016. About She was about three years. And the same year we saw her uh, with a male tiger. We were very excited about this is the female we had first captured in 2014. And that day we saw her with another male. 
So it was very obvious that she was perhaps mating. And very nicely in 2018, she reappeared in our camera traps. And this time, the, the fantastic news was that she had her own four cubs, you know, two of them here and two of them here. So it started, the you know, results have started to show up now. Uh, one of the key uh, things you see in uh, animals which have slow reproductive rates are um, uh, when, when they start breeding, you see that there is some amount of success already. So the female we had first captured in 2014 now has her own uh, cubs of about six months uh, in, um, uh, in our camera traps. So how do we identify? Again, as I said earlier, we just matched the stripe pattern. This was the cub about six to eight months in 2014. And this was in 2019. She had her own four cubs. So it's one of the fantastic news and uh, the way to monitor uh, using science to understand conservation success or otherwise. So this is another uh, wonderful story we got at the end of 2020 among all the gloom and doom of COVID. Uh, this uh, particular male tiger cub, which was first captured in 2018, February, we got him again in 2020, May, and then we continue to get him uh, very regularly. But the, that's not the important factor. The important factor is that he came from an area about 250 kilometers away uh, from Bandipur Tiger Reserve. He walked through several other tiger reserves and wildlife sanctuaries to be found in Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary. Um, uh, we, he was first captured in February 2018, about 250 kilometers away, 250 kilometers away. In May 2020, we first got him on camera traps here. Then um, since then we get him very regularly. So uh, and now he uses an area of about 450 square kilometers. As I said earlier, uh, this particular individual has a home range of about 13 times the size of Dubai city. It's a different individual than the ones I showed earlier, but still these are the kind of success stories you can monitor using science. So um, as I say, uh, wildlife conservation is not just about science. If you work with all the key stakeholders, it could be the government, it is the media, it is the social leaders, the religious leader, and communities, everybody put together, we can certainly make a big change for wildlife conservation. And that's the key um, aspect I think uh, is required. But you need to always use science and monitor your success or otherwise uh, in wildlife conservation. Thank you, and I'm open to any questions you may have. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Sanjay. Uh, we haven't, in spite of having done this uh, a lot, we haven't absolutely perfected our questioning technique. Uh, we found it's more convenient to for people to just ask their questions than to try to write them out. So I'm, I'll let people uh, unmute themselves if you have a question and uh, wait to ask it. But I would request, please, that you ask a question and uh, simply because you have the uh, your, yourself unmuted, don't use that as an excuse to ask a second, third, and fourth question because there will probably be others. I, I, I can't see I can't see everyone's picture and I don't see hands. I see Roger has a hand up. I don't know how you do that myself. Roger, why don't you go ahead with question one? Yes, thank you. I was just thinking about the idea that uh, propane is a fossil fuel and in any case is finite. I wonder what happens in the context of uh, the, the, the future, the long term future. Yes, Roger, you're right, actually, it's a fossil fuel. Uh, it's a very important question you have asked. But one thing we also have to see is communities also change, you know, we need to uh, look at uh, their convenience and their current uh, usage levels. Um, if we continue with fire road, we would neither have for forest, nor would we have habitat for uh, wildlife conservation. So uh, when we did our socioeconomic surveys, we also asked them what were the alternatives they were you, uh, they were interested to shift to. And the key alternative everybody was looking for was LPG. Uh, we could also, uh, we tried other uh, aspects, but they wouldn't work because of social aspects and all social issues. For example, India has a very strong caste system. So we were trying to 
to see if we could set up biogas um, uh, using uh, cow dung, you know, the, the fecal matter of livestock. But that wouldn't work because you needed to work with communities and there were communities would have several cars and they wouldn't come together uh, to work on a community level uh, biogas plant. This was a very difficult thing, one, uh, one to break the community, uh, the caste aspect of, uh, of communities, number one. Number two, uh, livestock itself is a serious problem in the landscape we work, so we didn't want to get more livestock. Uh, number three, if communities have to, or individual families have to contribute to this kind of uh, uh, biogas fuel, uh, it would put a lot of additional pressure on them. Some of them will have to buy livestock, uh, or some of them, if they're single parent, like a, a widow, uh, she would have to work uh, apart from her daily labor or the agricultural activity to contribute to biogas. So, and we also tried uh, in some of the communities where there was no availability of getting liquid LPG refill bottles. We have tried with other um, uh, low fuel, low consumption, uh, low uh, firewood collection styles, and that has also worked. But um, uh, it has to be a combination of things. We can't just uh, rely on LPG, Raja. Thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation altogether. Thank you. Thank you, Raja. I don't see any other hands up uh, signs. Uh, OK, I put my hand up. <laughs> So thank you very much for this excellent talk. And I really like the conservation efforts that, that you are doing. We heard this already from Cameroon, that the only way to do conservation today also is to help the people to find alternatives. And I really highly appreciate this. And I think it's a good way that you are going. And what I would like to know, um, how much research on the tiger ecology are you doing in this reserve? Um, how many insights can you gain in this well um, observed area with the camera tracks and so on? Sorry, I didn't get your name. Claudia. Hi, Claudia. Um, uh, uh, we don't, uh, we do a mix of uh, science uh, on the species. Uh, one of the things we are keenly focused on is uh, on the population dynamics, because that also shows if conservation is working, if it's not working, or if uh, or to also show that it's a, it's a good indicator of conservation management. So that's a key activity we carry out, but we also uh, carry out research on road ecology because some of the areas there um, has uh, roads passing through uh, important corridors, especially through wildlife corridors. So we want to understand how road and vehicular traffic impacts wildlife and are there alternative ways to uh, mitigate these uh, uh, problems. So we, we, we have one is we do population dynamics, uh, we do road ecology, but we also try to understand using science how communities has been uh, using the conservation benefits we provide them. For example, the, the example of LPG itself, we monitor the per capita thyroid usage before and after. We also monitor the lung function, which is a key indicator, a social indicator. So it's a combination of uh, uh, ecology, but also kind of uh, social indicators, Claudia. I have one question, last question, if I'm allowed. No, um, uh, Claudia, let others have a chance because Janet Harrison would like a question now, if that's okay. Is Janet there? Janet was asking, is LPG liquefied petroleum gas propane? Uh... I don't know about it actually. I'm not a uh, fuel person. Uh, sorry, somebody has to Google for it. <laughs> I saw somebody has a question called George Zhang. Um, he's asking, you have a picture of a tiger desiccated by a car. What did you do with the roadkill? Uh, uh, all the uh, wildlife, and even when it is in dead form, belongs to the government. So normally the government um, burns them, you know, when there is a roadkill of a wildlife. I hope it answers your, answers your question, John. 
Okay, there's uh, the one question I've got with regards to your cameras. Is there any way that if they get carried away, you could put some kind of satellite finding device on them so that in case they're not destroyed, you still have a satellite so that can take you and find so to help you find the camera? We are trying to do it. We are trying to develop it. Um, uh, it's not just the animals which or the tuskers which take away the elephant, the, the, the cameras. Sometimes even people and poachers, they all take over camera traps. We lose about 50, 60 cameras, uh, camera traps in a year. So that's quite a bit of investment that goes away. Along with the money, uh, it's also the rich data which, which gets lost. So we are trying to develop uh, something like a satellite uh, because a lot of these areas where we work also don't have a mobile signal. So we are trying to work with electronics engineers to find a solution for it. Uh, now we are in, in the process of building a prototype on it. Okay, and then, okay, Claudia, back to you because we don't have any more questions. Yeah, I just wanted to know, you saw the tigress with the four um, uh, little ones. How is it with the tigers? Do they behave comparable to lion if a new male comes into the territory that he will kill all um, the youngs from, from the foreign um, Father or not? How how will they distribute in in this territory? Yeah, tigers are also territorial animals. So the uh, new male would try to um, uh, kill young ones of uh, if they are fathered by other individual other males. Um, uh, so it's quite uh, normal, like any other large predator, which is territorial, that um, uh, males kill young ones of other um, uh, of uh, young ones of um, uh, of tigers which are fathered by other males other male tigers actually yeah it's a territorial animal yeah okay okay thanks claudia somebody has come back and said that lpg is actually propane and then we have um somebody saying um Again, Janet saying, excellent presentation. We've got many words of thanks. So quite a few people are saying thank you. But they say, is um, solar power not a viable solution or would the monsoons be a problem? Yeah, that's a good question. I'll uh, try and go back to my presentation. Uh, solar is a problem because it would have been a wonderful solution. But if you look at the um, the hut of this lady who got a LPG connection. For solar, first you need to install the panel and there's no roof to install a panel, number one. Number two, you need to have continuous water supply that is not available. You need to have, um, you need to place a tank over uh, uh, the roof and there's no roof. And to pump water, if you had continuous water supply, on the roof, you need to have electricity and there's no electricity. So these are all key practical problems. So until and unless it's not just uh, solving, um, uh, providing them solar panels, but it's, it's come, it comes with a host of other problems, which in, in uh, at a lot of times the government has to work on perhaps if it has to provide electricity to these kind of remote areas, it's gonna take time. Um, uh, in between, we need to provide them some alternatives, but solar, yeah, we, we thought of it, but many of the beneficiaries cannot uh, afford solar or cannot, um, even if we provided them with the, uh, with the hardware, they cannot install them because of the practical problems I told, they, I told you. But yeah, but we have provided solar energy for lighting because many of the houses are remote in these forest areas and um, uh, uh, we provide them lighting because elephants come close to their houses, especially after the harvest season, uh, when they have stored their um, harvest right next to the houses. Elephants come and people, if they can't, if they don't have electricity, they can't see the elephant and it leads to conflict, uh, sometimes at disastrous um, uh, results. That's why we provide lighting uh, to isolated households. Uh, leopards come and pick up livestock or tigers come and picking up livestock. But if we have lighting in the, in the livestock shed, a lot of times the predators avoid those areas or elephants avoid those areas. So we, pro we use solar in, in certain uh, instances or with certain problems, if there's certainly a solution. Or for, uh, for example, remote uh, forest camps where the forest uh, department personnel live, uh, there is no electricity available. So we also provide them with solar uh, panels for lighting. And if they have a proper uh, roof, we also provide them with solar pumps so that they can pump water from the river or from nearby water sources. 
There are in the, in the chat function, there are a couple of questions from people who seem to have more specific experience with some of these things. Uh, one is about working with the forest department and the other is about your p-value in the Harvard Thompson estimator. The, the, what, the question from uh, Sitan uh, Prasad is, what challenges have you faced while working with the forest department in your region? Um, uh, uh, Siddhant, um, working with the forest department, you know, uh, is a challenge for two, three reasons. One is uh, uh, there's always turnover of officers. So uh, when a new officer comes, he always, you need to go and convince that you, you know this area well and you mean well, uh, but that can be solved through a long relationship you build up. That's why if anybody invites me to go to some other part of the country to work, I don't go because um, everything works on relationships, either with the communities or with the government. If you have a longer relationship, um, you have a better chance of succeeding very well because they know you, they know your intention, they know your past work. So that's one of the things uh, which, which we need to ensure that um, you can solve it by being in a landscape for a very long haul. So conservation uh, is a long haul activity. You can't be jumping around from one area to another area or from one species to another area, another species. Today you work on tigers, tomorrow you say that I like uh, uh, rhinoceros more than tigers, I can't be shifting because uh, if you want to bring on ground changes, you need to be in the landscape for a longer time. So that's, that's what has made it much more easier for us. One is I'm from this local area. I speak my language, local language, and people know me now, or they know our people. Uh, so you have a relationship both with the government and with the communities on the long haul. It's, it's very easy then. So that's what is, um, the, once they know that you mean well, uh, the doors open up much more easily. And there's, a, there's a, a question that may be fairly technical. Uh, how long does it take to obtain a reliable value for the, the P, that's the probability of seeing things variable in the Harvard Thompson? If you can answer that in much less time than it takes to uh, obtain the reliable value, please go ahead. This may be one you want to duck, however. I'll not get uh, delve too much into it, Chris. Uh, Chris Wood is the person who has asked it. Um, uh, see, the p-value will never hit one because uh, uh, in wildlife, you can never see all the, detect all the animals in an area. That's why uh, p will never go to uh, one. But um, uh, p-value varies depending upon the number of animals that are found in an area, the number of recaptures we get. So it's very important that we have real, reliable and solid uh, design before we start our studies that you, you get good estimators at the end of the day. Uh, I'll not, I'll, I'm not, uh, uh, I'll not take your day explaining the statistical methodologies there. I think that's, Alexis had a, uh, Alexis had something with regards to GPS. Yes, good evening. Uh, it's, it was just really to say that in, in follow on to the question about uh, why don't you just add uh, GPS to the trackers or to the, the, the camera traps. And I was making the, the remark that this adds cost, but it actually doesn't get away from the, the challenge that these are in remote locations, that powering GPS is uh, going to be an issue. We want these camera traps to last for a long time, but also if people were to steal it's not just about animals stealing the trap, the camera traps, it's about people as well. Uh, it doesn't necessarily help. So the, there is ongoing work to try to reduce the cost of these uh, camera traps, make them more robust to protect them from the animals that are uh, inquisitive or, or destructive. Um, but there's nothing which you can really do to get away from people stealing the items, I'm afraid. Yeah, I agree with you, Alexis. Uh, uh, powering them is always a challenge. Um, uh, uh, so it's, 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 it's an ongoing research activity. We hope at some point of time, we get a solution for this. Gary, I think that's all. I think we can give it a wrap. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you everyone in the audience for joining us this evening. And thanks very much to uh, to you, Dr. Uh, Sanjay, for
for uh, taking the time out from, uh, I, I understand you spend most of your time in the field, so maybe we've given you an excuse to come back to someplace warm and comfortable. Uh, uh, thank you for taking the time out. This was uh, an extremely interesting presentation that covered uh, a lot of the different aspects of what you do. Our audience always likes to feel that they've gone behind the scenes a little bit and maybe been with you in some of your exploits and not just hear about the, the generalities. And I think you've, uh, you've satisfied everybody in, uh, in uh, taking us uh, into the, uh, the tent. So I really appreciate your uh, joining us this evening. And it's, uh, uh, we, we have as a group, we have had uh, uh, excursions from uh, Dubai into South uh, India. So who knows, maybe we'll show up on your doorstep. Uh, uh, after after COVID. Thank you sure, very much. Ben. Thank you very much to you, to Michelle and the Dubai Natural History Group for Thanks. inviting me to give this talk. And I, it was a pleasure talking to all of you. And if you need more information, my email ID is there with uh, Michelle, or I'm also on uh, social media. You can always um, uh, ping me. Um, uh, uh, there are two books uh, in English, which I wrote recently. One is called The Leopard Diaries. Um, the second one is called uh, Second Nature, uh, so Saving Tiger Landscapes in the 21st Century. Uh, if people would like to read more about our work and also about these species, you're welcome to look uh, for these books on Amazon or any other social um, uh, e-commerce sites. Um, uh, Leopard Diaries is one. And the second one is called Second Nature, Saving Tiger Landscapes in the 21st Century. And thank you very much. And I wish all of you a healthy 2022. And good night. Okay, just Dr. Gubi, before we go, we've got something from the Toronto Zoo. They said, thank you, Dr. Gubi. Our Toronto Zoo has Amur and Sumatran tigers, and your talk helps volunteers to interpret for guests. And we've had uh, many, many, many uh, uh, messages of thanks. So I'm going to call this to an end, but I just want you to know that many, many notes of thanks have been pouring in, and uh, this talk has been really well received. Thank you very much, Michelle, as well. I'm very happy that people like the presentation. And if Toronto Zoo would like to have a presentation or if they would like to interact, uh, they're very welcome to talk. I can see there's somebody called Dan from Toronto Zoo. Yes, surely I'll be happy to uh, work with them as well. Thank you again. Okay, brilliant. Thanks so much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thanks, for your time. Thanks again. Thanks again, Dr. Sanjay. And I just remind our, our audience that we will be meeting the first uh, uh, first Sunday of February. We probably will not be changing our date for February. Uh, and the talk will be on uh, snow leopards. So thank you all. See you again in uh, February, if not soon. Good night, Dr. Good night, good night everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Good night. Good night.